Jesus is giving him the most important principle in the whole Christian pantheon. In order to be a Christian, you must be born again. What does that mean? In the Greek, it's also interpreted being born from above. We're in John, Gospel of John, the third chapter, verse 3. Note what he says. Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The word see there comes from a Greek term meaning to discern, to comprehend, to understand, to perceive. Unless a man is born again, he cannot perceive the kingdom of God. Then he goes on. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus takes the definition literally. He thinks in terms of a literal birth, which is not what Jesus is talking about. <clears throat> Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I said unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and now here's, not, here's the sound thereof, but can it not tell whence it cometh, whether it goeth. So is every man that is born of the spirit. So what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about a non-physical experience that must be happen in a person's life to enable him to be a Christian. What is the new birth? Turn to God, John the first chapter. John the first chapter. John the first chapter gives you a definition of what the new birth is, what the born again experience is. is. <clears throat> Starting in verse 11. John the first chapter, starting in verse 11, Jesus came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, which were born, not of blood, it's not a physical birth, nor of the will of the flesh, you cannot achieve the new birth experience on your own. There's no work that you can do to make you become born again. Nor the will of man. A person pronouncing you a saint or a Christian does not make you born again. But of God. What does that mean? It means that the new birth, the born again experience is supernatural. Only God can perform the new birth. And if a Christian is a Christian, it's because at some point in his life, God has become his father through the new birth. If a person has not experienced the new birth, he is not a Christian. That eliminates quite a lot of people. We're going by the biblical definition that comes out of the mouth of Jesus. To become a Christian, you must be born again. God must make you a new creation. Turn to the book of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if any man be in Christ, if he's born again, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means that you become a new being. Born again. God makes you a new creation. A new creature which operates totally differently than the old creature. All things are passed away if you are born again. What does that mean? It means you are being prepared for a totally different life than you experienced before. What is the life you experienced before? Turn to the book of Genesis, first chapter. What was the mandate that God gave man when he created him? Genesis, the first chapter, verse 26 to 28. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, Replenish the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over everything that moveth upon the earth. You notice a theme here. Man is made a custodian over the earth. Man is given dominion over the earth. Man's life is tied up with the earth. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Okay. Well, in the born-again experience, that's negated. Turn to Colossians, the third chapter. <coughs> Colossians, the third chapter. Verse 1 to 3. Colossians, third chapter. When you get there, we want verse 1 to 3. Thank you. Everybody there? Yes. Okay. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. I'm going to repeat that. Set your affection on things above, not, not, not on things on the earth. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. That totally reverses Genesis, the first chapter, 26 to 28. In Genesis, the first chapter, man is made a custodian over the earth. His life is hid with the earth. Everything deals with the earth. In Christ, everything dealing with the earth is null and void. That's why the scripture tells us, if you are in Christ, all things are passed away. Turn to the book of Galatians, third chapter.
Verse 27 to 28. Third chapter. Galatians, third chapter, 27 to 28. Huh? It sounds like someone's speaking. Yeah, but you can't hear. Okay. What, what, what was the, the chapter in the, the book? Galatians, the third chapter. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. When you get there, 27 to 28. <coughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ. You lose your human identity in Christ. This is a scripture. This is what God is saying. Scripture is God breathed. And he's trying to let us know the new birth makes you something you were not before. A sentient being fitted for life in the heavens. That's why it's called the kingdom of heaven. And for an, an individual to enter into the kingdom of heaven, he has to be born again. Your human identity passes away in Christ. You take on the identity of God which is neither male nor female, black, white, bond, free. You lose all your human identity when you enter into relationship with Christ. Paul the Apostle understood this more than anybody else. And he feverishly tried to get the church to understand this. The problem that he had with them was they clung to their Jewishness, which is a human identity, and it limited them in the ability to progress in the new life that had been given to them in Christ. We're going to take a look at this new identity, what it prepares you for. <clears throat> Turn to the Gospel of John, 16th chapter. Jesus speaks of, is everybody in John the 16th chapter? What, what, what verse, please? Okay, I'm going to give you uh, verses um, uh, 13 to 15, John 16. Thank you. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God, that performs the new birth. Yes, we're back. Okay, we're in the Gospel of John, 16th chapter. We're talking about the new birth, the identity of the new birth. We're talking about the, the things that make us Christians from a scriptural perspective. <clears throat> you lose your earthly identity in Christ. You take on the identity, the eternal identity of a son of God. You are fitted for life in heaven, not life on earth. The saint is instructed not to pursue the things of earth because he has not been created for life on earth. He's created for life in the heavens. Now we're in the Gospel of John 16th chapter. I'm going to start again with verse 13. 
Albeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. The life of a Christian is not tied up with the life of the people of earth. The life of a Christian is designed to lead the people of earth so that they can comprehend a greater reality. The kingdom of God is the only message that Jesus Christ ever preached. And everything he preached from the gospel of the kingdom were principles dealing with the eternal state of the son who is born again and what he can expect once he leaves this world and enters into eternity. He can expect a position, he can expect an inheritance, he can expect a glory. But it's all commensurate with what he does with his life here on earth. Okay, did you just say that there's a position in heaven for this person that's seeking yes. the glory of God? A position in heaven? Yes. For those that are seeking the glory yes. of God? Okay. Yes. Yes, indeed. You said the three things. You said position, you said that, and you said, what was the middle one? Position, inheritance, and there are uh, basically comprehensions of life that you will ex experience when you leave this world. The Holy Spirit is given to us to prepare us for this. Turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, second chapter. Who has questions? Okay, so it sounds like we were born here on earth. As soon as we understand what, what's going on and we desire to have the born again experience, then all of a sudden we are trying to prepare for life in heaven. Yes. So that literally you have to be born again for that to actually be. So Mr. Jones, how's a person gonna know that they're born again? Through proceeding to experience the new birth. Confess. Confess what? That you are a sinner. Confess that you believe that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again for your justification. And confess to somebody else and you experience the new birth. The Holy Spirit comes into you and recreates you makes you an eternal being ready to be prepared for life in the heavens. So what we do is what you've just now said. Now, Mr. Jones, we don't look any different. No. We have to decide to want to change the way we go about living in this world. Um, yes. Pursue the knowledge and understanding. Yes. Yes. Okay. The change comes from within. There is no external change that starts initially because you're not born on the outside, you're born on the inside. The new creation lives within the old creation. The best example of this is if you can envision a caterpillar being changed to a beautiful butterfly. It's called metamorphosis. It's a change from within that at the time it's completed, it becomes a new creation adapted for a totally different environment. This is exactly what we're undergoing. Now, I said 1 Corinthians, second chapter, will give you an understanding of how the Holy Spirit acts, or what his purpose is, in being given to the saint. His purpose is to prepare the saint for life in heaven, not perpetually life on earth. First Corinthians, second chapter, starting in verse nine. 
everybody there? But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. What is this saying? This is saying that there is a vast panorama that has been prepared for that individual who takes that step and becomes a new creation. But in order for him to experience it, in order for him to even comprehend it, he has to be yielded to the, to the Holy Spirit. But God had revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of of God. The problem that Christians have in the new birth is making the transition from the old to the new. In order to progress in Christ, to comprehend that you're even a new creation, you have to determine that you want this. You have to determine that you're going to allow this this metamorphosis to take place in you because your old nature is going to fight it tooth and claw. The old man doesn't want to die. The man of earth wants to remain a man of earth. That's why the scripture is consistently telling us you have to mortify the old man that's in you so that the new man can manifest and prepare you for life in the heavens. You don't fight you don't change. Simple as that. Christians are not taught this. They identify with the old consistently because they never get a comprehension of what's new. They're told that there's something new, but they never experience what's new. Now I'll give you some scripture promises here that let you know what you can already have right now if you're born again. Turn to Ephesians, the first chapter. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus because they're new Christians. And he tells them basically what they need to do to progress, to experience the new birth. Starting in verse 15, Ephesians, the first chapter. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. So he's writing to them because they are now Christians. They have been born again and they're showing it through the love that they're experiencing and manifesting among themselves and among, among others. Paul is congratulating them for this. He's rejoicing in their acceptance of Christ, in their stepping into the kingdom reality. He goes on, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The first thing that Paul does when he hears about a Christian becoming a Christian, the biblical definition of a Christian is he goes to the Father in prayer for that person. Why? What is he praying for? Well, he's not praying for them to get saved. They're already saved. What is he praying for? He's praying that they will begin the path of understanding the new birth. Note what he says. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What is the spirit of wisdom and revelation? We just read it in John, the 16th chapter. When he's come, the spirit of truth will lead you into all truth. It is, it begins with 
what the church commonly calls the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has a two-fold purpose. To enable you to live the life of Christ and enable you to have revelation knowledge of the new life of Christ. It goes on. What will happen if you get this spirit of wisdom and revelation from the Father? Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Two-fold purpose. What it is that you are to do in this life and what's waiting for you in eternity. Paul talks consistently about the inheritance. The inheritance. They died because they would not live forfeiting the inheritance. They died holding on to the promise of the inheritance. It meant that much to them. And when you understand what you inherit in Christ, <clears throat> you would rather die than give it up also. So it's twofold. How many times do you listen to Christians that are going to church all their life, they sit on a pew and they don't know what they've been called to do? They don't have the faintest idea what it's all about. That's a shame. Paul says when you first receive the new birth, you're set on a path that the Holy Spirit, if you allow him to, will come into your life and open your understanding about what you are called to do in this life and how to prepare for the eternal position that God has waiting for you in the kingdom. He goes on to say, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now Paul writes consistently about what the new birth means to a Christian. He writes it so that the person reading the promise will pursue the promise for himself and attain to it. What are some of these promises he's talking about? I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know what happens to you when you die? Any idea? Yes. I believe it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What does that mean? Isn't the Lord present with us here in this life? Amen. Yeah, but you ascend immediately. Well, if he's present here, what, what is the difference between you being with him here and you being with him there? Um, what is the difference? Because you're actually physically, in that physically, but you know, you have the new book, but you're going to be with him immediately, in, with him in heaven. Because he's seated upon the throne. Jesus Christ is seated upon yeah. the throne. So technically, we're seated with Christ. Yes. I mean, I can't. like, And then to the right of him is the Father. Yes. So, I mean, but he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So is he with you here? Yes, he's the temple. So what's the difference? Um, what is the difference? We're a different plane right now. We're on this physical plane. Yeah, but he's present with us on this plane, yes. isn't he? Yes, yes, yes. So, again, what's what's the difference? Um, you, you said you go into his presence. A different plane? Di well, being in the kingdom of God. We're entering into the kingdom of God to be with him. What's the kingdom of God? This could be the kingdom of God too, because like can kingdom of God is within you. Earth as it is in heaven. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. It's it's you're you're coming yes, along. It's good. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Well, let's look at the, what the scripture says. Turn to Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, starting in verse one. <clears throat> Second Corinthians, fifth chapter. Now, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. 
If there's something you don't understand, please ask. <clears throat> For we know. Now, you will find Paul consistently <clears throat> saying, we know, we know, we know. Why is he saying that? Because the Holy Spirit is consistently giving him understanding. We just read that in Ephesians. The spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God will consistently give you two things. He'll give you perception, discernment, and he'll give you understanding. In other words, <clears throat> he will open your perception and then he'll make your perception understanding of what you have perceived. So Paul is saying here he understands something that the Holy Spirit has revealed to him. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, what does he mean? Any idea what he's talking about here? If you die. Yes, he's talking about the fleshly, physical body, which decays at death, goes back to the ground. He's saying if this happens, when this happens in the life of a saint, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What does that mean? <clears throat> you notice he uses two terms, tabernacle and building. What is a tabernacle? A tabernacle is a tent. A tent which in ancient Israel, <clears throat> they lived in tents. They would take them down, they'd put them back up, they could carry them from one place to another. But the tabernacle was temporary. It'd get old, it'd wear out, and you'd have to get another tent. Paul was a tent maker. He's comparing the body that you have in this life to what's waiting for you in the heavens. Compared to a tent, to a mansion that's eternal, immovable, and a consistently glorious in its makeup. <clears throat> Mr. Jones. Yes. So, it's telling us there's another body in heaven waiting for us. Yes. So is it also saying this body that we're currently in can't go to heaven? Yes. yes. So in other words, to make the transition, you got to use your heavenly body. Yes. Flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of God because it's corrupted. <clears throat> so what he's saying, you already have an eternal, glorified, celestial body waiting for you immediately when you pass this life. You immediately ascend to that body that's waiting for you there. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. Yes. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. Verse 40. <clears throat> there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. We live in terrestrial bodies, bodies adapted to life on earth. The medium in which life exists on earth is called matter. When you leave this world, you have a body that's been crafted for you, which is not made of matter. It's made of light. <clears throat> the medium of life in the heavens is light, luz. 
everything in heaven exists in a state of light. Why? Because the creator is light. God is light. He creates in light. So what Paul is saying here, you already have a body waiting for you. Every, God has made preparation for you. Turn to Romans, the eighth chapter. <clears throat> Paul talked about learning about your heritage, your inheritance in Christ. Your inheritance only comes to you if you're born again. <clears throat> Romans 8, starting in verse 16. <clears throat> And 17. Talks about the inheritance. Everybody there? Yes. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Important principle. The Holy Spirit is given to you to bear witness of the fact that you have been born again. The Holy Spirit is given to you that you might open up to enable the Holy Spirit to give you discernment and understanding about the new birth experience. If you don't do that, you're going to remain ignorant <clears throat> of who you are and you're going to lose out on what God hears for you. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. What is Paul saying here? You have a dual inheritance, a twofold inheritance. <clears throat> if you are an heir, you have an heir of God the Father, you have an inheritance from your Father. You have an inheritance, a joint inheritance with the Son, which is conditional. you got to suffer with Him to receive the inheritance that He has for you. Most Christians don't want to go that route. They're trying to avoid it. We must embrace the sufferings of Christ. We are called to be lights in this world, to be witnesses, so that the world can see the reality of God in us. The scripture tells us, if we are born again, there's a cross waiting for us to bear. Embrace your suffering. Because in the end, it's something that's going to be beneficial. Now, when we read 1 Corinthians, yes. Okay, so this suffering, I know the scripture says, if you're going to share in the glory of Christ, you've got to also share in the sufferings of Christ. But, so do we go looking around for a way to suffer, or does God give us sufferings that we learn to endure? Suffering is a tale of maid. You're going to experience them automatically on the path that God has ordained for you to walk. He ordained a path for the Lord Jesus to walk in which the sufferings led to the cross. Each one of us has a path uniquely constructed for us that if we are faithful to walk that path, we're going to experience sufferings. Simple as that. The only way you don't experience them is if you get off the path. So it sounds as if the sufferings appear even before we think about going to look for them. Oh, they will be there. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, they are, they're there tailor-made for a purpose. Now, the, the, the inference is what we read in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, is the inheritance that you have from the Father. A celestial body and a state waiting for you in the heavens when you pass this life. Turn to the book of 1 Peter, the first chapter.
First Peter, first chapter, verse three to four. Everyone there? Yeah. Right after James, which is after Hebrews, you come to Peter. Right. It should be closer to the book of Revelation. Right. Okay. Sorry. Now, you go to a deal. Look. After Hebrews. Oh, there, James. So after James. Hebrews, James, then Peter. Hebrews, James, up here. Okay, thank you. Sorry. That's okay. No problem. Duh. No problem. <laughs> oh. I'm mistake. sorry. First Peter. First, first Peter, Peter. First chapter. Okay, thank you. Verse three to four. Thank you. I'm sorry. No problem. Okay. Like like two years old right now. Everybody. Like, well, not how old I really am. <laughs> Everybody there? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Blessed be the God, 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 and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord establishes our inheritance establishes us being able to be born again and receive our position and our inheritance in Christ. And he goes on. It also establishes <clears throat> the position to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, if faith is not away, reserved in heaven for you. So when you pass this life, if you have been committed, you're going to go to your inheritance in the Father. There, you will enter in, into the estate which the Father has bequeathed to you as a son of God. You'll note in, in Jewish culture, the patriarch, let's say for Abraham, example, Every son he had had an inheritance, had an estate. David, the same way. <clears throat> the father always prepares an inheritance for his children. God the Father set that custom in motion. God the Father has estates waiting for his faithful children. What we are doing in life is preparing for entrance into our estate. Two things. <clears throat> Whenever the Father gives you something, He expects you to cultivate it, develop it. In this life, you develop the estate that's waiting for you in the heavens. Turn to Matthew sixth chapter <clears throat> Matthew sixth chapter starting in verse nineteen Everyone there. <clears throat> Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Why? Because you are not crafted for life on earth anymore as a new creation. Therefore, you are not establishing life here. You're establishing your life in eternity. That's supposed to be the focus of the same. That's the, the new birth impels you to focus on your heavenly destiny. So this shoots down my uh, desire to retire. <laughs> yes. So, yes. 
I don't need to amass a, a big quantity of money to retire for my later years? <laughs> well, let's continue reading here. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. <clears throat> in the Greek it's saying lay up for yourselves treasures in the heavens. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You lay up treasures on the earth, that's going to be your inheritance. You lay up treasures in heaven, that's going to be your destiny. The choice is, is, is left up to the individual. But the wise individual <coughs> will make provision for himself in eternity. He's not going to waste his time building up stuff. Number one, Anything you build up on earth is temporary. Nothing here is eternal. So a life spent building up an estate here is an exercise in futility because you're going to die one day and leave it right here. A life spent building treasure in heaven is wise because your treasure never, never, never ends. Whatever you start here on earth, and the scripture talks about you give somebody a cup of cold water, you have a reward waiting for you that when you enter into heaven that will never end. You're giving somebody a cup of water, the reward will continuously be yours forever. You spend time discipling somebody. That soul basically is going to be yours in eternity. Paul says he looked forward to the time when he could present the churches which become his crown of righteousness. Everything you do here becomes eternal there. So the idea is, Paul tells us, <clears throat> you pursue the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, he will give you understanding of the direction you take here to benefit you from an eternal perspective. Too many Christians are wasting their time focusing on things that are not beneficial from an eternal perspective. You sit at the foot of a man, I guarantee you won't make the rapture. You won't make the gathering. Because all that man can give you is what he knows. You sit at the foot of the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, you get into the highest positions that God has for you in eternity. How do you sit at the foot of the Holy Spirit? <coughs> Commitment. Faith. Allowing what God is doing just to come through. It doesn't take any effort. You folk function under the new covenant, under the new creation, and you automatically... Focusing at the feet of the Holy Spirit. Yes. I thought you were going to tell us. The word says, seek and ye shall find. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Definitely. So, there takes an effort to get this spiritual from the Holy Spirit at the foot of the Holy Spirit. There has to be a desire. So, if you seek it, you find it. Well, automatically, it's an act of the will. An act of the will, and we said that earlier, that you are not going to allow the carnal nature to dictate the direction that your life is going to take. Every day you have to mortify your own carnal desires. It's a daily battle. Paul says, I die daily. <clears throat> we put down the carnal desires. We're wide open to fulfill the spiritual desires. It says, walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. Every day you will grow a little more in understanding the things of God and the kingdom. Every day the Holy Spirit will give you revelation knowledge that you didn't have the day before. Revelation knowledge is progressive. And you find yourself looking back on the things that you once believed in and you will laugh. 
because you'll see them for what they are. And every day you get closer to your destiny. Now, I want to give you, before we close, one more thing. Heaven. When I say the word heaven, what do you think about? Jesus. The story from the guy when he told us he went to heaven. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's a little story. Sorry. Oh, yeah. like, why? Oh, oh the, we were um, witnessing in Hollywood, and um, this guy came up to us and he said, do you believe in Jesus? And we were like, yeah. He wanted to see if we were real believers. And he said, I'm going to share a story with you guys. I went to heaven before. And he said that when he was 33, he was like 66. But when he was 33, he was sitting in his room in Armenia. And um, God was sitting on his bed. And Jesus was sitting behind him. And um, he said that he went to heaven, it was faster than the speed of light. Like, you just, he just was there. Like, and I asked him, where is heaven? He said, it's in the sun. But, it, but I like, every time I read the Bible, it talks about like, I literally just opened up to where it says. It says, there, the, what you were saying. That's how God This works. is so that's, crazy. That's something, that's how remember how something used to be. There, <laughs> is, that's how God, yeah. there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon. So when you were saying in 1 Corinthians, um, this is 15, um, Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. But you're talking about celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies right here. But I was just reading just past when you were bringing that up, I seen the sun and it reminded me how like the sun is heaven. But it just like, he said that he never worked after he seen he left his business and God has supplied his needs ever since. So it's crazy the earthly things he 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 stopped everything is provided for, yeah. and he never I guess in Armenia he was doing business now he he never worked the day after or did business, but it was crazy for me because I wanted to know where is heaven. He said it's in the sun and that you. I said how does it look? He said everything is white and green, and he said you're protected from the flame. He said you're protected from the heat. And I don't, that was his experience. I'd never been to heaven, but... Okay, first and foremost, we're looking at it from a biblical perspective. The word heaven is nowhere in the Bible. Now it's, it's, look of, it's <laughs> yourself. It's you so will so not intense. find the word heaven in the Bible. If you look in the original language, oh. it's always heavens. The word is plural. In the Hebrew, it's Shemayim. In the Greek, it's Aranos. It's always, always, always plural. Why? Because God is a plurality. He creates in plural. It's the gospel of the kingdom of the heavens. Why? <clears throat> because when you go into understanding the plan of God, the creation of God, you will find that God has brought forth many, 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 many heavens. These heavens are vast regions. They are all inhabited and they all serve certain functions. Some heavens are eternal. Some heavens are temporal. That is, they are going to pass away. Others are going to be eternal. The kingdom of the heavens, the gospel of the kingdom of the heavens is given to us so that we can understand God's plan for the creation of the heavens and where we fit in that plan. Yes. In this book, I've read it somewhere where it says there is a heaven of heavens. Yes. It's heavens. So there's at least two. It's so heaven. The heaven and the heaven of heavens. It's heavens of oh. heavens. <laughs> okay. I stand corrected. Well, I sit corrected. Right. <laughs> Everything is plural. The only thing that's linear is here. The word earth linear. is linear. <clears throat> Why? Because there's only one concept of it. Man is plural. 
You are composed of three, body, soul, and spirit. That's the way God created us. Everything is plural. So, so what you're doing... Is there a higher heavens than all the rest of the heavens? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. Yes. The heavens of heavens transcend all the other heavens. And beyond that, of course, you have Epiranios. Well, the Epiranios. Yeah. Let's be very specific. <laughs> anyway... <clears throat> What you find when we talk about when we talk about the heavens and our place in them, God <coughs> has created positions that the Holy Spirit will make us aware of in this life that we can begin to qualify for that position. Turn to the book of Revelation. You want to look at the promises that God gives the born again saint so that we can get understanding of where we are, where we need to go, what we have to do to get there. Revelation, second chapter. There's two, actually three positions that we're qualifying for. Three. Three positions only. Kings, priests, and the bride. Now the kings will rule. Revelation, the second chapter, Starting in verse 26 to 27. <clears throat> he that overcometh. It always, the promises always start out with, you have to be an overcomer, a conqueror. You have to leave this life conquering Amen. all the challenges that have come against you. Otherwise, you can't qualify for these positions. He that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end will I give power. Where power there comes from the Greek term authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. The kings will rule the creation with the sun if they qualify for <clears throat> the joint inheritance with Christ, which only comes through sufferings. The second one is Revelation, the third chapter. Verse 12. The second position is that of teacher scholar, instructor. <clears throat> that would be you. <laughs> yeah, yes. <clears throat> the teachers are the ones that instruct the entire creations, angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, in the ways of God. They're consistently imparting revelation knowledge, just like the prophets imparted knowledge in the Old Covenant, in the New Covenant, in eternity, <coughs> the priests are going to be those that give understanding of God, God's purposes, God's way, God's plan to those of the creation. And they do it from the office of priest. Revelation, third chapter, starting in verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. <clears throat> he will speak with the authority of God. He will make proclamations, declarations. He will <clears throat> instruct the entire creation. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 
sixth chapter, closing with this. Wait a minute. What, is, what about Revelation 5 10? Well, we won't go into that right now. I don't want to give them too much. Just give them a skimming. First Corinthians, third chapter. <coughs> Excuse me, 1 Corinthians 6 chapter. Verses 2 to 3. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? The judge, <coughs> in your covenant, Moses was the judge, gave instruction, direction to the people about how to live according to God's way, God's will. About three million people came out of Egypt uh, <clears throat> when Israel was freed from slavery. And <clears throat> there were no kings when they came out. There were only ultimately judges because God didn't want his people ruled. He wanted his people educated. But because they rebelled, and because they didn't want to voluntarily do as well, he instituted kings over them to dictate to them what they needed to do, pass his laws to restrict the ability to um, rebel against him. But in heaven, you don't have that. You have God wanting his people to receive understanding, comprehension of his ways. That's why he has delegated the priests as the highest order in eternity. And the priests are given what's called revelation access to the things of God that the rest of the creation do doesn't have. And they're given the authority to give this to the angels, archangels, thrones, and dominions of the creation as <clears throat> it's necessary to receive. So what you see here, it says, know you not that we shall judge angels. So, in closing, this is just to give you a little comprehension of what the born-again experience enables you to pursue. Take these scriptures, pursue them for yourself, test them, see if, if they are <clears throat> what you've been given. And then, once you're convinced of that, pursue it. The Holy Spirit will fill you daily with more understanding as you begin to pursue your calling, you begin to understand your purpose. You begin to understand the ministry that God has given you. God will bring people into your life for you to instruct. We don't teach to be perpetual teachers. We teach so that the people that we teach will go out and teach others. And in that respect, God is glorified.